Day three of HRS 22 is a wrap, and our wrap up starts now. This is Heart Rhythm TV. Final day, we are done in San Francisco as the sessions are winding down, our friends are finding their planes. <laughs> I am with my co-anchor, Mahek Dande. Welcome. Thank you. And again, one of our new fellow reporters and already a pro, <laughs> and I know you even had three abstracts as well. It's hats off to the mentorship, really. Um, it was a fun meeting and uh, grateful to be presenting some abstracts as well. Well, today we had four nice presentations in mm -hmm. late-breaking science, and then we had a dedicated DEI mm -hmm. program, which is the first one to have abstracts, and Heart Rhythm TV was all over all of them. Absolutely. So, so tell us a little bit about what you saw at the late-breaking for sure, for sure. Um, really excellent, diverse science. You know, you know you're at the right meeting when digital health and gene therapy are sharing the same stage. So it was really great, diverse science. I'll dive right in with the first uh, project that was uh, presented was by Dr. Adam Lee. Uh, it was a combined project between UCSF and the Alfred uh, Hospital Center mm -hmm. in Melbourne, um, and they randomized patients to high power, low frequency, uh, low duration of radiofrequency therapy. Twenty nine patients, high power, high power, low uh, duration and then 31 patients for low power standard duration. Uh, and they really saw some impressive results in terms of duration of AFib ablation. So mm -hmm. 87 minutes for the high power versus 126 minutes for shorter the Shorter left atrial dwell time. Shorter low left atrial dwell time. The only caveat was that, and the study was not powered for this, we can't, so we can't draw too many conclusions from this. They did see a higher amount of CVA uh, based on brain imaging, but it was in clinical strokes. Sure. Um, and again, the study was powered purely to look at the amount of ablation time so that showed a positive result and I think that's where we could conclude the well, results. Well HPSD has been all the rage but you're right there has not been many comparative studies even though small about 30 and 30 in each group mm -hmm. it still shows you can get through it a lot faster and the pers and the clinical efficacy was quite impressive it was yeah. their secondary endpoint but still interesting provocative yep. maybe not large enough to be conclusive but a really yep. good one the one that i really liked was basic science mm -hmm. because we know pkp2 mutations are related to arvc and this was the first with gene therapy mm -hmm. trying to reverse the actual phenotype of arvc and favorably decreasing arrhythmias as well as rv remodeling Absolutely. Yeah. And as clinicians, we're all excited. When can we see this translate into humans? Of course, Correct. that's a long time from now, but very promising it starts, results. It starts Absolutely. with a single step. Yeah. And what was the other one that you really liked? And I know that we, I think Clint picked up all of these presenters <laughs> yes. right outside Clint the stage. Was all over it. Um, one of the studies, even though it's a registry study from NCDR, uh, 611 centers, was the one that Dr. Freeman from Yale presented. Uh, which Watchman com Flex. Mm -hmm, comparing Watchman 2.5 versus Watchman Flex. And the way that uh, the company kind of just retrieved all the equipment for Watchman 2.5 as soon as Flex was launched, kind of mm -hmm. created a very natural environment for, for this trial, wherein the providers didn't change, their experience didn't change. The only thing that changed was the device. And they did see uh, improved outcomes in terms of uh, major adverse events. Of course, these are all in hospital. Uh, but nonetheless, the new device seems to have better outcomes in terms and of... safer. And safer, less, for sure. Less effusions, less Less effusions, less tamponade, um, and also less leaks. Of course, uh, what the five millimeter leaks mean in terms of strokes, you know, we have some data now to suggest that less leaks equals less strokes. But mm -hmm. again, there's more to come on that. But um, promising device, the Flex. And then there was Mayo Clinic with the watch and mm -hmm. figuring out, can we actually diagnose LV dysfunction with the watch? This is Dr. Atia from mm -hmm. Mayo showing that maybe with about over 80% accuracy, we might be able to pick up heart failure or someone prone to heart failure mm -hmm. with just a simple recording from the wrist. So Absolutely. that is exciting stuff And as, as we move forward. Tell us a little bit about that DEI session because this has been a huge mission of mm -hmm. the Heart Rhythm Society. It's very clear that women are <laughs> underrepresented, even though we yeah. got 50-50 here in the booth today, yeah. which is awesome. And, mm -hmm. our, and our, our Heart Rhythm TV committee is just rich with inclusion and diversity, which is just really wonderful to see and it's been so fun to have you, but tell us a little bit about what was discussed there, what mm -hmm. were the things that you took home from? Absolutely. Um, as Dr. Hurwitz mentioned uh, during the session, you know, it's 2022 and it's about time we start discussing these things. There were three uh, posters presented, three presentations, oral oral presentations, uh, one by Dr. Tedro, who was subbing in for Dr. Butnam, who couldn't be here. Uh, again, powerhouse fellow. I think she had six abstracts.
abstracts, one in the competition, and that one uh, that was the winning abstract as well, which talked about the uh, starting out low numbers of women and uh, underrepresented minorities in the entire pipeline and how there's some attrition, but from the beginning to end, there's just a very low representation. And the importance of kind of including women early and minorities early, whether it's at the high school level or med school level, et cetera, to, to engage them into our, our community. Um, and then Dr. Essien from UPMC representing, mm -hmm. uh, presented, uh, a, a, talked about the decrease in a uh, number of patients were prescribed DOACs, uh, racial disparities on the number of DOACs mm -hmm. prescribed, which also, again, just points towards the importance of knowing our own implicit biases as clinicians at the grassroots level and the need for policy change uh, you know, at, the, at a more national level. Why do you think that all of your female friends in cardiology fellowship didn't pick the path of EP that you so rightfully chose? Excellent, excellent question. I think it all comes down to how early you found someone that you want to be like. And for me, I was fortunate, uh, all my male mentors, uh, you know, Dr. Essie, so everybody at Tufts and, and uh, all the attendings at Pitt, they've just been very supportive uh, of my career. But it's hard to envision yourself doing something well and successfully mm -hmm. unless you have a role model who's doing that. And it's just the numbers. You know, if we had more women role models, I think more women would be involved. And the other thing is we need to recruit them early. Um, as you said yesterday, EP is the best kept secret, right? Mm -hmm. We just need to Usha show Petra them the that. light. I didn't say okay. it, but I, I believe it. <laughs> you paraphrase. Um, um, but as you know, as Dr. Tedros said, I think it's important to talk about why EP is such a great field, and you'd have to convince someone not to do EP, um, you know, if you really look into it. So, um, early recruitment and uh, intent uh, measures for sure for and increasing early engagement. Diversity. And there's so many societal initiatives in which young high schoolers should that are may be interested in STEM, mm -hmm. and medicine is definitely part of that. Need to be exposed earlier. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do yeah. as society, but I think we're doing the right things. Mm -hmm. And again, if you don't know what an electrophysiologist is supposed to look like, and yeah. you can only see it look one way, then you can't really see think outside the box, exactly. which is really critical. So anyway, this has been incredible. <laughs> Thank you for staying behind with me on the last day. <laughs> day three really is a wrap. Heart Rhythm 2022 is a wrap. Mm -hmm. Next year, Nola. we're going Nola Mardi Gras <laughs> style. We'll be in the streets there as well, and Harvard and T is going to get a little more wild there compared to San Francisco. Maybe not, but we can't wait <laughs> to see you, Heart Rhythm 2023, in New Orleans.